Yes, Mr. Williams. Um, my Lord is aware that I represent the Guardian through a private solicitor, so I'm not instructed by Kafka's legal. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. We have yes. very much Sorry. considered you. my Lord's invitation. I, I, <laughs> I was misdescribing you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I do regret, though, my Lord, that we won't be able to assist uh, on some of the policy. Um, <coughs> Solutions that Mr. Um, Hames, may I attract still, it, or the court can still endeavour to take advantage of your expertise in this area and ask you questions of and course. invite you to make submissions on those. Yes, of course, my lord. But the, the Guardian was a, clearly aware that she can't really speak for Kafkas, and uh, I can only no, I, am, that, I, I, I absolutely yeah. understand that. I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, of course, it would have been uh, no doubt of assistance to my lord in the GNG appeal if if either the child or indeed Kafkas had been represented in that hearing, but uh, alas, they weren't, uh, and they weren't represented before the Supreme Court either. But uh, I think I can only just really repeat what I said before lunch, that even the tactical timing of an application for uh, asylum to the Secretary of State coming, as I'm afraid it often does in, in, in recent months, uh, immediately after uh, a summary return order uh, is something that only the Secretary of State, uh, only the uh, asylum system, and ultimately only Parliament uh, can do anything to regulate. Because it is my submission that the family court, as indeed the Guardian found herself in, in this case, uh, has to accept the Secretary of State's decision. Uh, and um, my rather, or our rather clumsy uh, attempt to describe the situation as set aside flowing by operation of law is simply a reflection of the principle of non refoulement that attaches itself to a decision of the Secretary of State to grant asylum. Yes. What, I, what, what we meant by that uh, is that no further factual determinations would be necessary, no further judicial evaluations uh, would be necessary, no further disclosure would be necessary, no further investigation by the guardian of this child's wishes, feelings uh, uh, and, and perspective on welfare issues to the extent that he's able to express those views in line with his maturity. Um, it simply means that automatically, by operation of law, by dint of the Secretary of State's decision, and the legal consequences that flow from that decision, it, it, it means that uh, a summary return order made in Hague Convention proceedings, pursuant to a prior determination, um, has nowhere to go. It is limping. Nobody is submitting that the family court does not have to accept the Secretary of State's decision. That is not the case as being, as I understand it, advanced. The, 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 this case concerns what the family court should do once <coughs> the Secretary of State has granted asylum. And your submission is the mere grant of asylum means that the family court has no choice other than to dismiss the Hague application. Is that right? When there's already been a determination. So th these are the particular circumstances, the particular chronology. So regardless of the background circumstances, those are my words being inserted. Once a determination has been made... By the family court. No, been made to grant asylum. The family court has no option other than to dismiss the Hague application. That's not quite with respect my submission. Then it's where there's already been a determination by the family court, which is this case. There has already been a determination of the Hague Convention <coughs> proceedings. But on different factual allegations? Well, we don't know that. Well, that's course. what Mr Justice Roberts seems to say. And if the but Secretary of State had the decisions on the initial information, it would be very odd 
if she decided to grant asylum, notwithstanding those decisions. So the two factors of Mrs. Justice Roberts' decision and the oddity of the Secretary of State. Well, it's not for the Guardian to question the Secretary of State's decision, whether it's odd or not. Uh, no, but the Guardian can't. There's something new has happened. It may, it, it may or may not be um, something new. The reality is that the Secretary of State, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's for new material or old material, uh, or she takes a different view uh, on her evaluation of the same material, it, it matters not in my submission. But in that case, why is it relevant that there's been an earlier determination? It's simply irrelevant. Well, because your argument would work once there's a decision of the Secretary of State, whatever the family court had been doing. Well, there, there may be other valid reasons why the family court uh, may wish to consider for the first time, at, at least, an application for a summary return order under the Hague Convention. Following the grant of asylum? Well, this is, in this case, it's prior to. No, no, but I'm, you, you, well, I, I, I rather understood my Lord's question was, what is the situation if the grant of asylum is made before yes. the family court reaches the ah. determination? And I, and because the point he was putting to you is why would there be a different response from the family court depending on whether the grant of asylum was before or after the Hague Court's decision? Because the reason why it would matter is because the Secretary of State in, in my Lord's I think, first example would not have the benefit of the High Court's determination of the application where it, on the facts of this case, the Secretary of State does very much have uh, not only the judgment of Mr. Peel, QC, but all the material. But then, as my Lord said, it's, the, the, it would appear to be possible from a reading of uh, Mr. Justice Roberts's judgment that the material was different. So the Secretary of State has not had the benefit of the Hague Court's decision on overlapping or the same material, different material, including um, the material from the Hague case, but some other, as yet unknown, uh, factual allegation or allegations. Well, my lord, then would, would the, the, the court or the, the parents, and particularly the child, would have Hague Convention proceedings that kept going on. I think what we're trying on. to explore with you is what is the difference between why does the the, the <coughs> fact that the family court has made a determination have effect the principled approach to the relationship between the two different applications? Because the Secretary of State will be made aware of that prior determination. Well, not if it's a determination on different allegations. And 69 says, I accept there's an inconsistency in terms of the totality of the information, and she'd seen the file, and we haven't. She made the decision that there was no purpose served from that's allowing... A point, well, I, I accept that, that that's a slightly different point, because I accept that the learned judge rejected our uh, argument um, based on what I've characterised as operation of law. But, my Lord, what, what is clear from G&G &G, uh, is that um, the family court... Uh, shouldn't determine applications for the sole reason of endeavouring to influence uh, the Secretary of State uh, in the exercise of her powers. So it, it is my submission that the Family Court would need to be very careful. There may be some cases on different facts, different circumstances, um, where there should be a determination, either before or after uh, the granting of asylum. But in this case, where there has been a determination, there has then, in the, in the teeth of that determination, been an asylum claim. It, it doesn't matter in our, I, I appreciate I'm repeating myself, but it doesn't matter in our submission whether the material is, is old or new. The fact of the grant of, as, of, of asylum really uh, ties the hands of the family court. It, it's made its determination which is, of course, entitled and must do um, under the Hague Convention. 
but the Secretary of State has chosen, perhaps on different material, perhaps on the same material. Well, we know it's different. Well, we know we, we've different. had the hint it that it's inconsistent. That's all we've got to go. On. Yes. So we have to, we have to, what? we have to acknowledge that that's what the judgment below says. We know it's different. We don't know the extent. Of it. But but then one one could could have it going backwards and forwards between. Well, not if the, the mother Secretary does the State. obvious thing and says everything up front. When she goes to the court or she goes to the Secretary of State, she says fully and honestly, this is what is happening to us as a family in the Ukraine. But as I understand it, what happened here, she went twice to the High Court, didn't comply with the order, and then months later appears to have made inconsistent or further allegations to the Home Secretary. So there wouldn't be a going back and forth if everybody did what G&G &G well, thought and they put everything on the table first in a proper open transparent system. Well, of course, if that had had happened in this case, then there wouldn't have been the the toing and froing that would now happen if this appeal were no. uh, allowed. But it's difficult to see how the family courts uh, can restrict, um, using its own powers, the ability of a of an unsuccessful um, abducting parent from making a. Application for asylum. Toing and froing is not the result of the system. The toing and froing is the result of different applications on different bases. Secondly, that doesn't necessarily mean the Hague Convention Court can't deal with it. And thirdly, there is still the contempt application because not having made the application for months whilst the order is outstanding, whether or not you commit somebody to prison is another question. But there are three reasons why it's undesirable for a parent not to come clean with the court. Well, I, I, I don't dissent from. Uh, the undesirability of it, um, but Mrs. Justice Roberts was faced, like like the Guardian, was was faced uh, with the situation where there there had been this uh, undesirable, um, certainly as far as timing, claim for asylum that nonetheless was accepted by the Secretary of State. My Lord, what so I, I, just. Your submission is that once there's been a determination by the family court, followed by grant of asylum, the family court has no choice other than effectively to set aside the order and dismiss the application. Yes. So you then slightly developed that and said there may be circumstances where that wouldn't. No, no I was referring to my Lord's other alternative, which is there may be circumstances where there has not been a determination. Okay. So that is absolute rule. By operation of law, but yes, that's our respondents' notice. Yes, that's but, and as you argument. can tell from the questions, I don't think any of us quite understand operation of law. You, you, you mean that the court would have no choice other than to exercise its powers under the Child Abduction Convention, uh, the Act, to dismiss the application. Yes, mandated. Yes, there's no further discretion, no further evaluation. I repeat that submission. That is required. In all circumstances? Yes. Right. Where there's been a grant of asylum after a determination by the court. What happens to the order that exists then? It, it, would, it has to be set aside pursuant to... But that's not an operation of law. That, that, that requires somebody to do something only to go back to a court, a court to be convened, an order to be handed down. It's not operation of law, like frustration of a contract when you're sent to prison and you can't work anymore. There's no operation of law. There's a legal impetus to reach a particular result, but it's not an automatic conclusion. Well, on, on, our, our, on our respondents' notice, we submit yeah. that it is. Um, and all that's required is, is, a, is an order setting aside the return order. Which, which makes it clear that that is the and legal consequence the and, and the dismissal of the yes. application, but yes. And what law is that? The real law of the reformment, of the reformment which flows from the grant of asylum. That's a principle that's in Article 33 of the Convention, but that's not been incorporated. Then there's the directive. You'll have to remind us of the requirements to show how the directive requirements mean that it is a legal consequence 
there has to be a setting aside and a dismissal of an application made under an Act of Parliament. Well, it's a, re it's a consequence of the principle of reform and that is clear in Article 7 of the Procedures Directive and Article 32.33 of the 1951 Geneva Convention and indeed the Immigration that's Act. Not but that, that, that's, my Lord, that's simply dealing with the principle of reformment. Yes, but that's a principle. You're talking about an operation of law. A law is something like a statute, an incorporated convention or a directive. And that will say you must not grant or even consider an application made under an Act of Parliament. Mm. And I'd be quite interested to know which provision, other than the principle of reform that you're referring to, requires this court not to consider an application that Parliament says we've got to consider. Well, I confess I don't quite um, understand my Lord's question because the court has already determined the application that Parliament has said that it has to determine in this case. And they made an order. Yes. But you want to set that order aside and you want the application to be dismissed. And you say all the judges are is an automatic cipher through which that comes. And that's because of what you mystically refer to as operation of law. But you haven't yet <laughs> identified the law that requires the setting aside and the dismissal. Well, other than the principle, and you say Article 7 of the Procedure Directive. Well, I, I, other than the um, principle of refoulement. You don't which mean operation of law, no. I think is the short point. You mean that the court has to be involved because there's an existing order which has got to be set aside, and there's an application which has got to be dismissed. Only the court can do that. You say, yes, the court has to do that, effectively as a rubber stamp. Yes. That's what it comes mm -hmm. to. I, I, operation of law. Yeah. All right. All right, I, I, I accept that <laughs> characterisation. Perhaps, my lord, it would be appropriate if I can um, leave this, leaving aside the respondent's notice and seek to persuade my lords that um, Mrs. Justice Roberts' decision and her reasoning uh, should be upheld. Uh, my lord, the uh, essential conclusions are expressed in uh, paragraph 76 of her judgment at 1 to 1. My lord asked. Um, Mr. Harrison about whether uh, counsel below perhaps um, concentrated merely on the question of set aside rather than the uh, reconsideration or redetermination of the application. I, mean, I endorse what my learned friend has said, but with this caveat that uh, in my submission, Mrs. Justice Roberts didn't, did not in fact fall into um, the same trap that perhaps the bar, we at the bar did. And that's made clear from paragraph 76 that, that she, in the preceding paragraphs, uh, had set out the approach of read B. She plainly knew what, it, uh, what was required by that, um, that, that, the test laid out in that authority. Uh, but she, she distinguished the approach taken in, in read B on its facts. Uh, yes, the, what, what? Sorry, go on. And, and the, 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 the central reason for that is set out at the third sentence of paragraph 76. Yes, I mean, I, I think that's the point that Lord Justice Coulson was asking about this morning, is that effectively it would seem from that, those sentences that the judge decided, as you're submitting, that the mere, the mere fact of the grant of asylum meant that there was nothing more for the family court to do other than to dismiss the application. Yes, but she doesn't quite, she earlier made it clear that she was rejecting um, well, our she, submission. She did, but yes. here she just says there has been a decision. Well, then, then so she, she goes on and adds a little li bit more. Little pur well, little purpose. Yes, she accepted our submissions about that. Uh, and that the, Without further purpose or effective remedy. Uh, the only... Um, purpose would be to allow the 1980 Hague Convention proceedings to, to use, I think, our expression, limp on. Well, she says there's nothing further for this court to examine. Yes. So it sounds to me, that reads to me, that she did accept effectively the submission that, as you're submitting to us, it was mandated. She had no choice other than to dismiss the application. 
because there was nothing further, there's nothing to examine. Well, that's, that, that's what um, she goes on. There's no further evidence which is relied on, which is potentially relevant to the set-aside decision. I think by using the set-aside decision, she was embracing both stages I... A and B and C and D. She was considering whether any useful purpose would be served not only in setting aside the original order, but uh, making case management directions for uh, any redetermination of the application. Why was there nothing further for the court to examine? I think she deals with that earlier on in the uh, earlier <coughs> earlier on in the judgment, where where she sets out the background. and accepts the, the weight, and it's not an absolute on, on the judge's own um, reasoning, but the, but the weight that needs to be attached to the grant of the asylum. Um, she would have been aware of the, the, the overall um, position, of course, the, the, the background chronology and the, and the Guardian's uh, previous reports that are in my Lord's supplemental bundle. But um, she decided that there would be no purpose served by allowing the proceedings to, quote, limp, unquote, on with the further evidence, the further investigations that would need to be, uh, need to take place if she didn't um, dismiss the application there and then. Would there be this purpose that if the court considered the fresh allegation and decided that in fact they were uh, evidence of Article 13b grave risk, that would be another reason for um, not returning the child. So if the Secretary of State over whom the family court has no control suddenly revokes the grant of asylum for reasons that we know not, situation in Ukraine changes or whatever it is, the fact that they've come to an Article 13b decision which on reflection turns out to be consistent with the grant of asylum, wouldn't that be something for the A court to examine? Well, that would, that would be a little bit of a contrivance because the only application that might be made would be to set aside rather, set aside the order uh, rather than um, simply endorsing Well, the mother uh, the would order. be setting it aside. The father would be saying, give a, give a new one. And the mother would say, no, don't just set aside this one don't give a new one other either because there is a proper article 13 basis I didn't tell you at the time but there are these further allegations and she could make those and they may establish article 13 B grave risk to the child and the Secretary of State may for reasons <coughs> we know nothing about revoke the asylum well I'll, I'll let um, my Lord Prime Minister Payne deal with the, the question of, of revocation but my, my Lord will be aware that Hague Convention proceedings are intended to be summary yeah. They're also intended to provide a remedy in, in what's often called a hot pursuit circumstances. Yeah. Um, th this, if, if one then allows uh, yet further reconsideration, then allows the Secretary of State to consider the question of revocation, one's getting a long way from well, my Lord's, the idea of a hot pursuit. Sorry, my, my, my Lord's point was that, that the purpose, uh, an, another purpose would be a determination of the Hague application which led to it being dismissed on uh, what might be called a, a more um, thorough determination of the uh, analysis of the evidence. Is that not a purpose? Well that's not something that Mrs Justice Roberts thought um, plainly thought would be a purpose for this particular child on these particular facts well, what's your in these submission? particular circumstances. What's your submission? On this? Well, we, we respectfully ag agree that in the context of this case, um, looking at what the judge knew and what we submit was the position of uh, the child who, who we re re represent, there would be no purpose uh, for allowing these limping proceedings uh, to continue it wouldn't be necessary for the court, for the family court, to endorse uh, a previously made return order 
uh, just in the off chance that the Secretary of State might revoke um, the grant of asylum. If that were to happen, as I hope I submitted, the purpose of the Hague Convention uh, for there to be summary procedure, uh, usually where uh, the child has recently been abducted, uh, could not be served. Uh, and then the only um, way that uh, a court could determine a child's future, which may or may not include a return to the Ukraine on the basis that perhaps the Secretary of State revoked the asylum claim, would be in welfare proceedings where we've, we've accepted that very different considerations would apply. And indeed, that, that's what we would suggest is the answer to my Lord, um, Lord Justice Coulson's conundrum about the father <coughs> not having the material, not having the reasons why a decision that impacts on him, on his family life. Uh, because if he were to make uh, an Article 21 application, uh, through the central authorities, instructing no doubt his current solicitors uh, to make a domestic application for a child arrangements order, then within those proceedings uh, he could uh, uh, and would be entitled to make uh, an application for disclosure of the asylum file. That is indeed what happened uh, in the um, Court of Appeal, Mr Justice MacDonald's um, asylum case that uh, I think is called R and R and G at first instance, and um, tab four. Second, tab four is indeed is the the, the wrongly described um, tab in the, in my lord's bundle, and then Secretary of State uh, and R H in the same case in the Court of Appeal, which is I think tab six. And it's plain from paragraph four, this is page B151, that that was exactly what happened in that case, where the Deputy High Court judge, hearing the application for disclosure within the context of the Hague Convention proceedings, declined to make an order for disclosure of the asylum file. Whereas in the following Article 21 proceedings for essentially a, a have, uh, spends time with contact order, Mr Justice MacDonald came to a different decision, namely that there would be disclosure of the asylum file. Uh, and the Guardian, for her, her own part, is very alive to the different considerations that might apply to a, to a live Article 21 <coughs> application, where the welfare of child is the paramount consideration where there may well be need to be fact finding of course depending on uh, the nature of the article 21 application uh, and where the the asylum material may be relevant if not directly to those facts at any rate to the credibility uh, of the mother in particular but the parents generally now it may be said that armed with that material, if that disclosure application were to be allowed, at that stage the, the father may have a lingering hope of attempting to set aside the uh, grant of asylum if it hasn't at that stage already been revoked. Um, in, in those circumstances, uh, he would have his remedy under <coughs> domestic law uh, on a best interest assessment. Uh, he should not be permitted, we would submit, uh, to, to have uh, the opportunity of resurrecting what we describe as a, a limping uh, Hague Convention application uh, for the reasons that uh, I have already outlined. My Lord, the uh, judge below, plainly in her judgment, we would suggest, was, was very alive to the conflicting difficulty, or the issues, the conflicting issues and the difficulty that she had to face 
given the very recent grant of asylum. Uh, and we do, in general <coughs> terms, commend uh, her judgment to my lords as being very careful, thoughtful, and, and indeed sympathetic to the predicament of the father. Uh, and, and we accept, uh, the Guardian certainly accepts for her part, uh, that uh, there, there is that difficulty <coughs> looked at from the father's um, perspective. But again, looking at her wider welfare remit, uh, she suggests that the clear solution to that difficulty is for the father uh, to make his Article 21 application. I accept that part of her thinking is because it's her very clear recommendation to the father, indeed to the court, that the best way for the father uh, to resurrect uh, his relationship uh, with the child is to accept what the child is saying about wanting to stay uh, in this jurisdiction, in this country, with his mother and his stepfather, uh, and then trying to seek uh, a reintroduction of contact uh, to him through that means. I make that submission particularly in response to the, the obvious concern of this court that this is a father who, it is said, is being denied the most uh, essential tenets of natural justice in not knowing uh, the reasons why uh, his Hague Convention application has been rejected, other, I stress, than knowing well, it hasn't that... Been. That's the subject of this appeal. Well, he knows, he knows in broad terms the reason, because he knows about the grant of asylum. No, he doesn't know why. No, <coughs> I We don't that. actually know what the convention reason no. is, whether the allegations are that he's a <coughs> Ukrainian nationalist who regularly beats up his wife and son because they're Russian speakers. We know nothing about that. And he's mm. sitting there. He doesn't know what the allegations are. He doesn't know why asylum was granted. Mm. All he's told is he won four times in the court and uh, you can't have the child mm. return to a country where the child was born and grew up. That, that's the only family law um, option that, that we submit that he has. Uh, it's otherwise, it's a matter for the, the Secretary of State, uh, for the asylum system used generally, and, and of course Parliament. If the par Parliament wished to give him uh, the opportunity to get reasons to understand the decision, then it can legislate accordingly. Um, it's our understanding that there is no obligation on the part of the Secretary of State to provide people in the father's position with, with the reasons why uh, she's made the decision to grant yeah, asylum. Yeah. Uh, all the Guardian can do is to, to put forward um, arguments based on her assessment of, of what is in the child's best interests. Yes, uh, my lord of despair. So, what, what in fact the, the, the court below did do, um, which uh, we were, we did not invite it to do, which is to use um, or was invited. It, it didn't. Uh, the father was almost obliged to adopt his own contrivance uh, as to how the court could proceed. Uh, which was to invite the court to deem an application uh, for both the set-aside and then the reconsideration of the Hague Convention application, which, um, which, which uh, device, uh, plainly as it, as it was, um, was simply intended firstly to get the uh, material from the asylum file um, in the aim of trying to get some sort of redetermination of uh, the Hague proceedings, which he could then use um, against uh, the Secretary of State in order to put pressure on her to redetermine the asylum claim. Uh, and we submit that the, the judge was um, right uh, to be alive to that contrivance uh, and um, essentially to reject it. I don't quite follow that. Um, We've agreed that there was a court order. Actually, I think there are five, of which the mother was in breach. 
and those were still all extant orders. The last one's obviously the relevant one because that's had the most up-to-date date by which everything should have been returned. So that was the extant order. We've agreed that uh, the court had to do something, although I understand your submission to the court ha had effectively, to, as I put it to you, rubber stamp um, the uh, uh, refusal and the dismissal of the application because of the asylum order. But the court had to do something. The matter couldn't stay in limbo. So if you were wrong about it being by operation of law, then the court had to do something. Uh, and deeming an application to be made to set aside was probably the most sensible, pragmatic way of doing it, wasn't it? Well, if, if, if on the basis that there, there wasn't the, the rubber stamp that Otherwise the mother submitted. remains in contempt. Well, yes. I mean, that's a feature yes. of this case. The mother is still in contempt um, um, until this matter is finally resolved in relation to the five orders. Um, so, so it was in her interests, if she was wrong about it coming to an end by operation of law, that there was a deemed application to set aside. The mother, uh, neither the mother nor the guardian um, sought to make an application for the, for the yeah. reasons that um, we've outlined. Well, that's so because it, of the operation of law. But if that's wrong, then what's, what's wrong with the deemed application? Well, it, it's it can't stay here forever. It's got to be resolved one way or the other. Well, my, my, my point is that it, it illustrates the, the difficulties that, that the judge was facing. Uh, and she had to accept the contrivance of a deemed application uh, simply to, in order to be able to give effect uh, to the reality, which was that this uh, return order um, could either be left in limbo as a limping set of proceedings, uh, or she grasped the nettle and, and not only set aside the order, uh, but dismissed the proceedings. Yeah. And Don't we owe obligations to the Ukraine? Aren't we supposed to be telling them what's happening? I mean, are we going to leave an order in place which says return when we know it's not going to be enforced? And can the mother stop that even being considered by saying, I'm not going to apply to set it aside? I'll leave it there. Well, of course, the, I don't think Ukraine would be entitled uh, to know the, the detail or even the fact of the decision to grant asylum. You know, but the what order, the Ukraine please. did know, that the order did know about the order of, of Mrs. Justice Roberts. Indeed, Mrs. Justice Roberts, in her order, uh, made clear provision for the order to be sent to... No, but if there hadn't been a setting aside, if there's no operation of law now, Mr. Haynes, so the order is there... Despite your persuasive submissions, it doesn't disappear magically. Something has to happen. Is your submission the mother can say, no, I'm not applying. The order remains in force, and I'll just carry on breaching it. Or is the court entitled to say you've made a deemed application or to act of its own motion? Well, the, the latter, the court can act of its own motion to set aside the order and dismiss the proceedings. Or it can deem an application. But the, but the point is that that's plainly a, a bit of a contrivance because it's the father who is inviting the court to deem an application in circumstances where neither the mother nor the guardian at that stage it has made the set the aside application. The mother and the guardian's job. Yeah. The mother and the guardian should have made the application. I'm sorry, using the word contrivance, who is contriving this situation? Is it not the party who is not making an application but is not proposing to abide by the order because they say they can't? How is that not a contrived situation, to use your word? Because there's no, there's no formal application before the court. No, but that's the, yes, yes, you understand what I, the point I'm well, asking you. At that, at that stage, there was, um, the, the, um, the court was fully aware that the outcome that the Guardian sought was for the child to remain in this jurisdiction. But, but at that stage, because the hearing was set up prior to the grant of asylum, and no application had yet been made by the guardian. I mean, plainly, the guardian would, would have to give anxious consideration uh, to that application being made. So your submission is it was a contrivance for the court to deem an application? 
Well, it was, at the invitation of the father. But shouldn't the guardian or the mother have gone straight back to court to say, I know you've made an order, I know the mother's broken it time and again, but it's time now to remove the order because it can no longer be enforced. Shouldn't they have been going back to tell the court, you've told me to do this, but I can't do it. In the past, I haven't done it, and now I can't do it. Well, Why I... shouldn't they have been under an obligation to comply with the court and help the court do its job? Well, in due, in, in due course, um, if Mrs Justice Roberts had not uh, set aside the order and dismissed the proceedings, no doubt, uh, as, as I've already indicated, the Guardian would have to give uh, anxious consideration to making an application to set aside the return order uh, and then seek the dismissal of the proceedings. But my, I, I revert to the point, the position that the Guardian took at that a hearing, which was that nothing else needed to be done. Uh, Mrs Justice Robert, Roberts refers in her judgment uh, to there being little point in, in making formal applications, uh, little point in there being further evidence required, further investigations, uh, because it, it was inevitable that not only would the order be set aside, uh, but the, the proceedings dismissed. My Lord, our, our, our essential point is that the, the Hague Convention proceedings, uh, in terms of the evaluation of the court and the assessment of risk, uh, had been concluded by the time the matter came before Mrs Justice Roberts. But all that she had to um, determine is what was to be done, uh, given that there had been a grant of asylum. Uh, and the uh, solution, as she saw it, was essentially to call stumps to conclude the proceedings, um, which we submit was almost an inevitable uh, consequence of the grant of asylum. Uh, and that was the, the, the narrow basis that, that she made her decision. Uh, the, uh, the only alternative would have been to get, cause yet further delay uh, to um, give case management directions on um, a, either a deemed application or on the basis that at that stage uh, the Guardian was intending to make uh, an application. Of course, the Guardian would need to uh, consider very carefully whether the welfare uh, of the child required that. Uh, and then the very um, process that the judge wished to avoid, namely uh, a limping set of Hague Convention proceedings, would simply carry on with yet further delay, yet further intrusion into um, this very vulnerable a child's um, child's life. Um, my Lord, I was going to just give some very brief references to the Guardian's um, assessment in the supplementary bundle uh, as yes. to how vulnerable uh, this particular child um, is, but also how much he needs to be protected uh, from <coughs> the threat as he no doubt sees it, and it's clear from what he told the Guardian, that's how he did see it, of being returned uh, to the Ukraine without his mother. Now, uh, the Guardian's report, um, her, her subsequent welfare, her, her last welfare report was made before she was made Guardian. Uh, she was um, a reporting officer then of Kafkas, but if I can just take my law to the supplementary bundle. Sorry, I guess I missed it. I, I didn't think there was any suggestion that uh, the child would be going back without his mother. Oh. Did I? You said that's what you said. All right. Well, the, there was. He was concerned about being returned. He was very. Yeah. Mother. He was. I know, but there was. No, that might have been his perception, but that was a false perception. If yes. that was his perception, yes. because there was no prospect of him going back without his mother, because his mother made clear that she would return with him if an order was made for return. Yes. So I misspoke, my lord. Yeah. Thank you. Um. <laughs> C, yes. C, C 35 at paragraph 20. Uh, 
there's, there's a description from Miss, Miss Magson. I, I should just emphasize that she wasn't the guardian at this stage, but was um, making this report at the direction of the court. Sorry, why, why are we looking at this? The, these are welfare yes. points. You're, you're saying, I mean, the, the, you're, are you saying that on welfare grounds, the Hague application should be dismissed. No. So no. Why, are we look, why are we looking at these? If it doesn't assist, I'll... No, but I'm just asking you, first of all, why are we looking at these? Well, it, it's, it's what, part what of the... What does it it's, it's part of the, 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 the wider context that Mrs Justice Roberts knew she was um, operating under, which, which justifies her conclusion of paragraph 76 no, of the judgment. No, because she never considered the issue. For example, she never considered whether the stage had been reached now whether the child was mature enough to object to going back to the Ukraine. She never considered whether it was a grave risk. I thought the whole point of what she did and what you were asking her to do was that she shouldn't consider that because that was all now irrelevant because after the last order, the mother went and made an application for asylum which was granted. So these weren't things that the uh, judgment was based on as I understood it or have I misunderstood it? I think my Lord has it, oh, right. I may say so. Uh, if, if this As is you put it, the Hague Convention proceedings had been concluded by the time it came before Mr. Mrs. Justice Roberts. So therefore, all of this would be immaterial. All right. Well, I, if, it, if it's not going to assist, um, I, I hope my Lord does um, is aware of the background of, of the Guardians. No. <laughs> Mr. Right. Hayne, yes, we are, and we've read those reports, but... The question is, what is their materiality to our decision? What was their materiality to the judge's decision? And what we were asking you to identify is what that materiality was. And I think you accepted that, that it wasn't material. My, my Lord, I, I won't um, go through that. Uh, Sorry to, then. to... No, <laughs> so be it. No. May, I just, may I just turn my back? I'm not trying to... I'm not intending to stop you making a submission that you want to make. Just trying to helping me understand it. That's all for us, my lord. I, I don't propose to repeat anything else that's no. in the, okay. the skeleton argument. Any questions? No, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Toomey. <clears throat> my lords, um, can I <clears throat> just uh, begin by um, a reference to the mother's position before Mr. Justice Roberts, and she did not contend. Uh, that the uh, return order um, by operation of law fell away. That, that was not her case. I, it may have been um, suggested otherwise in, in uh, just a moment ago. Yeah. Um, that was not her case. In fact, her case very clearly was that she had to do nothing. Um, that was her case before Mr. Justice Roberts. So leave an extant order requiring her to do something but saying, I'm going to continue to ignore it. I suppose what she ought to have asked for is a stay. Uh, what perhaps the court might have asked her is whether she wanted a stay. Uh, but she was represented, of course, by them. Yes. And she didn't seek a stay. But you're, you're not. <laughs> well, I was about to put something in hyperbolic terms. I won't. Um, something had to be done about the order. It could, the, the court couldn't just leave an extant order requiring someone to do something, but knowing that they weren't going to do it. I think, I think that must be right once it's before the court. Yes. Because, of course, this court will be aware that there are many orders made up and down the land, particularly in relation to children, which uh, may be settled by the court. The parties move away from court, and they're given no... Um, they're not put into practice. No, but the that's court doesn't know about that. Yes. But here the court did know about yes. that. Yes. Well, there's so a committal see... application anyway. I mean, the court is being asked, not on this occasion, to send the woman to prison for breaking the yes. orders. Yes. This was not a situation where the parties had sorted it. This was a situation. No, no, quite. Uh, of active engagement. And the question is, why didn't the mother go back and say, look, I can't do it now. Whatever the court said, I'm really sorry now, but I can't do it because of the Secretary of State's decision. And even in your skeleton, I thought you were saying that there was still no deemed application and the position must be left with the order in place. 
Well, I think the, the difficulty with the deemed application, I mean, for example, there's a, there's a ra there are a range of potential options, but if one, for example, looks at the family proceedings rules that relate to this, and we set that out in our, in our skeleton at um, page 47 in the bundle. Shouldn't you be asking the court? Your client has gone to the Secretary of State. She's made an application. The consequence of which she says means that she should no longer be required to comply with the order that the court has made on a number of occasions. Shouldn't she go back to court and tell the court what has happened? Well, she's in contempt of an order. Yes, and she, she, so you have heard to your contempt, you should go and say to the court, I'm really sorry, I know I've not done what I should have done. There's a good reason now. Yeah. She can't just say, I'm ignoring you, can she? Well, I'm, I'm not going to contend <laughs> that um, it would be right for her to do nothing. I'm simply letting the court know that at the last hearing... When the hearing her position was wasn't, followed, you didn't need to do anything, the order should stay in place. Position. Yes. Yeah. But in relation to the application, the, one of the difficulties that the... Um, the practice direction now amended since the law's decision uh, in uh, RED, and this is at page 47, envisages the, the willing applicant, as it were, where there's been a fundamental change in circumstances, right at the bottom of page 47. If you have evidence of such circumstances and wish to apply to the court to set aside its decision, you should use the procedure in part 18 of the rules. So the, the practice direction envisages an application being made. Hmm. Uh, yes, I think on this occasion, what was before the court was in effect an application for disclosure. And the court then sought to sh short circuit matters, and we say in, in an acceptable way. Uh, in an acceptable, acceptable way. Uh, and because the court has power to dispense with any requirement of the rules or practice direction in Rule Four Point Seven, is it? Or I mean, the court or certainly has, has yes. those powers. Uh, and indeed, it's right to say that in a substantive welfare jurisdiction, the court and we've referred to the case, the long-standing case of Reed, uh, where Justice Butler's loss. The court has a wide-ranging power to determine the extent to which it in, undertakes an inquiry if it's a welfare. Uh, depending on the circumstances of the case. So in this... So whether or not it's acceptable to deem the... It's, it's acceptable to determine the relevant issues, namely, should the order be set aside? If it is set aside, what should then happen, yes. putting it loosely? Yes. So um, the, the first point I wanted to address was the presumption, if there is a presumption, that the reference to that the learned judge's reference to the inconsistency in the totality of the information as between the family pay court and the Secretary of State necessarily should be, um, one should infer from that something contrary to the mother's um, bona fides. Well, it's difficult for you to make submissions, isn't it? I Can you help me as to why the judge was given the file? I know reference was made to an order looked at that order, the provision. Do you know why the judge was provided with the material? I, I can do no better than to, because okay. I wasn't at first. You weren't there, you but, weren't, yes. But my understanding is that because there was an issue of disclosure, pending at that point, the asylum determination, which the judge considered a, it would be helpful. She, she, made a, sorry, she made a case management order before the determination. Yes because there was an issue about whether these documents should be disclosed. Yeah. So it's the case managing judge. Yeah. She said, well, I better see them. Yeah. So that's why she... To help me with my decision. To help me with yeah. my decision. Yeah. Because, of course, one never knows when the Secretary of State is going to make a decision. Of course not. Right. And it could be months hence. Yes. Yeah. So if there's a disclosure application and there's a, there's a row about whether documents should be disclosed, then the judge at first instance will almost always, I'm not saying this in the family jurisdiction, but generally will almost always look Yes, and, and, and at the moment, we'll seek the assistance of the Guardian who act as a sort of filter, although that is not necessarily a straightforward process, but I don't need to deal with that in, no. in this appeal. No. But, um, so you, you were, were dealing with a point about what the mother's bona fides? Well, all I can say, because I don't know the 
uh, as my lords. I don't know what lay behind the grant of asylum. Uh, and from what I understand from the letter from Mr. Payne, um, neither would the child or the mother from the letter. But um, they, she would know, of course, what material was put before the Secretary of State. Yeah. But there could be a change of circumstances, a more recent than the uh, Hague uh, determination, giving rise to the valid claim for asylum. But as I said this morning, we can't make any decision based on no. that assumption because we're not being told what the reasons were. So that, that we, we can't. Who knows? Responding. All, all we're going on is paragraph 69, where the, words, where the words are anchored and inconsistent, which suggests to the informed reader that there, there is some overlap, but not complete overlap, and that yes. there is some stuff that's new. Yes, but it has been said already that uh, was being intimated that the mother might have tactically held back. Mm. And all I'm saying to this court is the court cannot assume that. Well, the word is inconsistent. The totality is inconsistent. Well, I accept there is an inconsistency in terms of the totality of the yes. information which has been made available. Yes. So the aggregate of the information before the Secretary of State is different to that before the Hague Court. Yes. And all I say to this court is it cannot assume that that is a result of bad or malign action on the mother's part. Um, it might well be that there has been a change in circumstances relevant to the grant of asylum for the Secretary of State had all the material before the Hague Court. And one cannot assume that it's a tactical holding back. Well, the problem is it's more than just that. I mean, we do know the whole chronology. We know that there was one order, she complied with it. Then there were the further orders, she applied yes. for a stay, didn't get it, applied for another stay, and I think that was on the 26th. Yes. Then there was a committal application, that was the 30th. The Home Office got the application for asylum on the 2nd of November. It may have been sent on the 20th of October. <coughs> and despite all of that, there's no explanation at all from your clients as to what change there was externally. There had been a coup in Ukraine, I mean, there hadn't been a coup in Ukraine, but you know what I mean? There's nothing to tell us, or the judge below it seems, why suddenly, after all the orders and the failed application for a state, there was suddenly an asylum application. No. And then you read section 69 of the judgment, and that talks about inconsistent information. And you begin to think, well, what, what's happened here? What has gone on? It refers to an inconsistency in the totality. In the totality, yes. And um, again, the, the hearing was not set up to determine an application for setting aside. Um, and a redetermination. It was set up primarily to look at the disclosure issue. And the mother, therefore, um, was not, as it were, uh, put in a position of re being required to set out the information relating to the asylum decision. Yeah. So the, the asylum decision, for whatever reason, and I, of course, it, one might have a suspicion, given the history in this case. But if you were able to say, I can't tell you what the change of circumstances were, but there were a change of circumstance, and that's what suddenly happened on the 19th. Something happened on the 18th, 19th, 17th of October, and the world changed, and she had no choice. I can't tell you what it is. It would be a bit comforting. <laughs> but you can't do that, I imagine. Well, I suppose it would be, in the first instance, it would fall to the, the child. It's the child's application. And the child's but it was like, made by the mother. You can't tell me the 12 year old child posted the application to the Home Office on his own. The child instructed solicitors, as I understand it. And the child made the application without the mother being Ch The involved. child act acted through solicitors. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> I don't know any more than that. All I, all I say to this court is um, the this is part of the difficulty, I suppose, in my Lord, Lord Justice Moylan's um, keenness, I think, to uh, ensure that wherever possible um, that there are, no, there are not these tactical applications and that parties are not holding back with a view to deploying the asylum application later. Um, the difficulty is that <coughs> one doesn't necessarily and, and often will not know, because of the confidential nature of the asylum application, whether that is something that's happened in a particular case. If you look at the last sentence of paragraph 69, the circumstances where the additional information might have resulted in different outcomes on both occasions, that's obviously the Hague return orders. Mm -hmm additional information which might have resulted in different outcomes. Yes. 
maybe that casts a little more light. I, I, difficult to tell. Well, well whether the judge is difficult there. to tell. There's additional information. Yeah. We know that. Which might have made a difference. <coughs> Which might have made a difference. Yes. Whether that whether that was so not gave. a new event because it might have made a difference at the time that yeah. the Hague Convention decisions were being yeah. made. Mm -hmm. Whether in fact the grant of asylum arose from something else. Well, that we don't. We can just focus on the fact that there was, uh, as I said, some overlap, but clearly some additional information. And just mind, there's been no explanation as to why the information wasn't provided to the Hague Court at the first occasion or the earliest occasion possible. There's no explanation for that. Is there? There's, there's no. There's no explanation at all addressing the asylum application. No, no, no. The, the, the Hague Convention Court application. It looks as if there's additional information which had been available at the time the Hague Convention yeah. Court might have made a difference. And there's no explanation as to why it wasn't produced to the Hague Convention Court. No. And on this analysis, it would have been more favorable to the charge staying in England, not going back to the Ukraine by analysis. So we, we don't know why that wasn't put to the court. No, and, and I can only assume that the relatively summary nature of the investigation is the reason for that. But um, what we contend is that um, the appellant was seeking to make um, an application for, in effect, he was seeking to bring the application before the court to set aside the return order for a purpose that was never and has never been intended by the rules, namely to uphold and not to set aside that order, and separately to use the family court or the uh, high court judge in the Hague proceedings as a means of reviewing a decision already made by the Secretary of State. And so we would say that this can properly be regarded as a use of the Hague court process for a purpose or in a way which is significantly different from the ordinary and the proper use of the court process. Well, in essence, we're saying it's an abuse of the Hague Court yes. process. Then in respect of both of those, so first of all, ordinary use. Uh, as to ordinary use of such applications, it went beyond the contemplation of an application for setting aside a return order. And as to that, the laws were already been taken to paragraph 76 of the judgment. Can I just, sorry, if you just your first part of that, name to uphold the order. Yes. I, I think actually what the, unless I've misunderstood it, the father is seeking is a rehearing. What he would hope to achieve with that rehearing is obviously another return order. Yes. But not strictly upholding the order, a new order. Mm. Yes, that's right. But so it's still... is that a, an improper purpose? Well, it was open to uh, the learned judge to determine it was an improper, person, improper purpose in the circumstance of this case, or else it would, or alternatively, it was open to her to determine that it was not a proper purpose um, for this, for the Hague Court. Sorry, to, to inter I just want to simply. Are you saying this is what the judge did decide? Because uh, I, I don't remember improper purpose featuring other than in respect of the reviewing the Secretary of State's decision. I don't remember improper to seek a rehearing. Uh, well, I think that? it's, no, I think it's, um, it's no more than we've already looked at, paragraph okay. 76, okay. that sentence, okay. which I, I agree with Mr. Holmes. It appears to be both rolled into one. As it says, without further purpose, it's rather different from saying the appellant is using it for an improper purpose. It's hard to criticise. I mean, what else was the well, father supposed to do? Well, he has a return order. Go back order. to court. He has a return order, and he's seeking the same order. Uh, yes, but he wants all the allegations to be established. So they, the court, he hopes, will say there's no grave risk. Well, well, well that's right. And on so the basis of all the information, not just the bit of the information that the mother yes. produced last time. Well, right? there, are there are two aspects. There's the use of the Hague process. Mm -hmm to undertake a rehearing with a view to the same result. On different information? Maybe so, but the same result. 
So ordinarily, it'd be, it would be an abuse in ordinary civil proceedings to seek the same result by a second action. But in ordinary civil proceedings, you don't lose by reference to some event that you had nothing to do with, was not nothing to do with the judge, and you can't know the reasons. I mean, the word Kafkaesque, uh, I've been trying not to say, but uh, ultimately, isn't that where you get to? I mean, to say to say to the father, well, you're you're abusing the system because you want a new return order in circumstances where he's being told that by operation of law he's lost the war, having won every battle. Uh, I find hard to fit into ordinary civil litigation. I have to say. Well, I, I suppose an analogy may or may not be a helpful one, would be to sue for a debt and to find that the company's gone bust. You can't enforce the order because the company has no money. Yeah. Um, so This is so different because there was the order and she complied with it. Then there was another order and the mother didn't comply with it. There were two further orders she didn't comply with. Judgments were sent off to the Secretary of State saying why there wasn't a grave yeah. risk. And everyone assumed in the light of G&G &G that the Secretary of State would decide accordingly. But suddenly, we're now told the son, not the mother, the mother appears not to have been involved in it, there's an application for uh, asylum, complete with new information, and the mother says, I'm not going to tell the court anything about it, I'm not going to go back to the court to apply to set aside, I'm not going to tell them what the new information is, I'm not going to tell anyone anything. Uh, very hard to see that that's anything improper by the father then to go back to court and say, well, what can I do? Should I set it aside and have another hearing? to see whether the, I really am putting the child at grave risk or well, not. It, the the um, use of the word improper is a reference to the use of the Hague process. And um, is it right to use the Hague process uh, when the order that one is asking for cannot be enforced? And is it wrong of the learned judge to look beyond the um, the rehearing, and to find that if she uh, if she were to make reiterate the order on whatever new circumstances she may or new facts she may do that, equally that order cannot. But, but, so but mean, then, sorry, sorry. But just to go back to your analogy with ordinary civil litigation, it, it, it's very common for people to seek orders from the court that they know they can't enforce at the moment. And then there are terms, I mean, in the old days, it used to be called a football pool's order. You made a, 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 an order against somebody or a company that couldn't pay, but you kept it open on the basis that one day they might be able to pay. Yeah. Well, and years ago, I did the lottery rapist, and there was a uh, football pool's order in that case, so we were able, about 15 years after the event, to ensure that the order was then once he'd got the money, uh, enforce. So it is quite common for people to seek orders that they can't enforce at the time. Yeah. I'm not necessarily saying that's the best use of the court's time. I, that I completely follow. But as a matter of principle, there's not a difficulty with that. But I think I think in this case, the judge was entitled uh, to, was she not, to take account of the fact that there had been a decision about asylum. And just to think through the consequences of that for the Hague litigation. So she undertakes, let us say she undertook a, re, a full rehearing. And let us say within the full rehearing, she uh, and all the parties are privy to the relevant information that, let us say, could have been before the first Hague court, or the second Hague court, but wasn't. And having heard all the um, evidence, she was the Article 13b defence. She would not be directed to issues relating to the revocation of asylum. And she can't check up on the Secretary of State's decision. No. But she could have gone through this routine. She could have said to herself, the whole purpose of G&G &G is to work in cooperation. Mother tells me everything. I take a decision. It goes off to the Home Secretary. Hasn't happened here. I have been told everything. Or well, the first judges weren't told everything. New and additional information comes after all the heavy losses in the court's first instance. Yeah. So what is contemplated by G&G &G 
hasn't happened. So we'll go back to square one. We'll have the first hearing again. We'll see whether or not the allegations that have been made now do stack up. And the Secretary of State can decide what she wants to do in the light of any finding that I make on that basis. Yes. That's what should have happened. I accept she could have done that. Hmm. But I don't accept she was obliged to do that. that. she was obliged to. What but it would be open. It would be a proper use of the Hague Convention to take that approach, would it? Well, it would, it would be open to her to have taken that step if she thought it was proper. Yeah, and but by could you think it proper? Would it be acceptable to think that's the proper use of the Hague Convention to try and recreate fifth time round what should have happened if all the information had been yeah. provided the first time round? Yes, because she's she's obliged to deal with the case justly under yeah. the overriding objective. Yeah, and so if she thought it was proper, presumably she'd think it would be a way of bringing justice to the case. Yeah, uh, she's very clear that she applied the overriding objective, uh, and I think one where where it's not clear one can impute to her in her judgment. So I, that's why I don't take the point that there is some operation of law which gets rid of the return order. I do accept that the court has got a problem to deal with and has a discretion as to how it goes about dealing with that problem. And what I say this judge did is she took account of two matters which were open to her to take account of and in the exercise of her discretion decided not to embark on a full-blown inquiry, as it were, under um, little d of the guidance uh, in how to deal with the setting aside and rehearing of Hague applications. Sorry, I had thought I had understood your submission to be that because there had been a grant of asylum, uh, there was no purpose, in fact it was an abuse, of the process to seek a rehearing and to seek any further Hague order. That, that is something that she had to take into account. No, is that, that was, it's not a knockout blow. No, but I thought that was your submission, that it was a, 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 an abuse. In the circuit, yes, but an abuse of the process of the court is not in any event in civil litigation a knockout blow. There's still a discretion. But st yes, so but it is the fact of the grant means that the Hague court should not reconsider. In g, g it was quite clear from both the Court of Appeal decision and the Supreme Court decision that the fact of the grant of asylum did not stop the court hearing the application. Yes. What's the difference in your submission between a hearing to rehearing? There's, there's no difference, I, I suggest, it, but, but it must turn on the facts of the case. As a matter of principle? As a matter of principle. Right. And so she was entitled to have, she was entitled to ask herself whether this was a proper use of the Hague process. And that is effectively what she did. And I'm saying that it's open to her, it would have been open to her to conclude, though she doesn't use this word, I believe, but mm -hmm. open to her to conclude that uh, undertaking a further investigation of the facts when, in all the circumstances of this case, there would potentially be no merit no ultimate merit or benefit, she was entitled to, as it were, take a shorter route and to rely upon the, the grant of asylum as the reason for the set aside, the fundamental change, but also a strong weight in the balance against a full rehearing. Because of what? Because that order cannot be enforced. No, but that's, that's the same. If you're saying there's no difference in principle between first hearing G and G and rehearing, then uh, they're not suggesting in G in a, Lord Stevens wasn't suggesting that the court could not make should not make a return order in the light of the grant of asylum, because in paragraph 158 he said it might lead to reconsideration. Yes, but I don't so, take that as authority for the proposition that um, in every situation the court must go on. To right. So the court has taken into account the asylum has been granted. Yes. And then, in this then, case, what I suggest the court is perfectly entitled to take count of is um, what might be regarded as a long and winding road that will lead back, as it were, to this family, uh, this, to, to the uh, to the Hague Court. I have to be careful I don't complete the, the verse. <laughs> but um, what would happen? Wait, 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 is this just, it, it's too long? 
Well, what would happen? The process has taken too long, so you, you give up. You, well, you don't give up. You weigh everything carefully in the balance. So what would happen in this case if she were direct? But sorry, the, uh, uh, in what balance are you... As to whether to embark on a full... In, to whether to embark on a rehearing. Yes. So you're looking at what, what might the outcome be of that rehearing, or you're not doing that. You're simply looking at the process. You're saying, the process. this has gone on for too long. It's time to bring it to an end. You're looking at the process, and I suggest you're looking at the. Pro you, you start by looking at the pro. Or she could have looked at the process, with um, assuming the best outcome for the father at every turn. Right. So let us, uh, as I say, let us assume that the material uh, is obtained out of the uh, asylum application and is considered in the Hague application. Let us assume that the court hears the um, rehears the question of whether there should be a return order. Yes. Makes reiterates the return order, says some uh, very helpful things for the father and some very unhelpful things about the asylum application. Yes. That material is then sent to the Secretary of State. Secretary yes. of State then um, revokes the grant of asylum. Um, then presumably someone appeals because there is a right of appeal against the revocation at that point. And at some point, if the asylum revocation stands and the child is no longer a refugee in the eyes of um, the Secretary of State or the court that reviews it, the matter comes back, undoubtedly comes back to the Hague Court, where there will be yet a further application for um, setting aside on yet further new information being presumably the delay, the effect of the delay upon the intolerability of the situation for the child. The, um, and your submission on that occasion would be, no, don't have a rehearing, or would be, yes, have a rehearing. It would be then, yes. Would be, have a rehearing. Then you would have so to... So you don't have one now, but you would have one later. Well, I'm, I, what I'm seeking... Is that seeking, not slightly inconsistent? No, what I'm seeking to do, my lord, is to um, uh, address what the court needs to consider in the reality of this situation. Right. which is a summary application for the return of a child to his home of habitual residence. I, I understand that, but one, one of the problems with that as a submission is that it then encourages parties to take every tactical opportunity to delay, to hide, uh, to string out the process and then say, well, it's gone on for so long, surely you must now recognise that this is no longer a, a, a decision that's in the interest of the child, so please can you... Um, dismiss the application and that's not quite the message I think that the Hague Court would want to send out Well, well my lord that, that, I, I can't uh, disagree with that sentiment of course but as soon as one has a situation where asylum decisions are taking months and months This isn't because the asylum decision took months and months and months the delay that we're in here is for very, very different reasons, actually. Yes. Uh, the delay here is because there was a fulfillment of the first order, and then there was a second taking from the Ukraine. The child's interests are supposed to be at the forefront. He should be in the country where he was habitually resident. The courts of that country should come along and decide it. When that didn't happen, the courts in this country said, no, the child should go back, and it can be de properly interest can probably be dealt with in the Ukraine. But the mother said, no, I'm not taking him back. I want to stay, no. I want to stay, no. Then there's the asylum application. That's what's happened, and that is the fear, is that unless people are willing to accept that the courts are motivated by the best interest of the child, but if their decision is one that a parent, whichever it is, mother or father, doesn't like, then they must cooperate with that decision and go to the country with the courts that are supposed to decide what's best for the child. Yes, well, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I was responding to my Lord, Lord Justice yeah. Boyland's more general point. Uh, and the more general answer to the point, or the more, more, the, the more general um, situation one finds oneself in, is that the decisions are taking a long time. And therefore, um, even when asylum, unlike this case, asylum isn't granted, and then there's an appeal, and potentially another appeal, each of which takes time. Yes, but that's why Lord Stephen has talked about a streamlined process. Mm. Yeah. And we have, I think now, it's referred to somewhere in the papers, a, 
dedicated, uh, thankfully, a, a dedicated service set up by the Home Office to deal with uh, asylum claims in this situation. Yes, and, I anyway, I, I think suppose I'm only speaking from um, experience that went to this the court. But um, if, if there is a streamlined process, and if in reality decisions are made quickly... But I think we're getting... Qu what the, 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 the I was seeking assistance on what difference in principle there was between uh, what was decided in G&G &G in this case. And, I, and I, I think your submission is there's no difference in principle between uh, in the approach that we should adopt to set out in G&G &G between a first hearing of the Hague uh, application and a rehearing of the Hague application. No, that's right. And that, that, I think, is what the, the judge herself sought to do. I think at, at some point in um, her judgment, she, yes, it's uh, paragraph 57 in relation to her preliminary conclusions. Uh, she accepts the Secretary of State's submission in her final claim. That yes. principles apply with appropriate modifications. Yes. yes. So of course I, I ex accept that is what she uh, was entitled to do and what she um, sought to do. Thank you. So I think um, the courts identified the, the, the two stages, the setting aside and then the rehearing. And it would appear that in respect of the setting aside, the court is asked the question, is there a um, fundamental change of circumstances undermining the basis on which the order was originally made? Alternatively, is there information the court should have known the first time? And it's the asylum, grant of asylum, which amounts to the fundamental change in circumstances. And so in my submission, the, the judge on the set aside was entitled to look to nothing more than the fact of the grant of asylum. And the question really then arises to the rehearing, whether in considering the rehearing, the court was uh, entitled to look at little more than and, and, uh, the, the, the fact of the grant of asylum. Uh, and I say little more than because it's at paragraph 76 where she does say that she accepted submissions that there was little purpose served by the Hague proceedings linking on. So she then yeah. goes on to say, in the context of those proceedings, there is nothing further for this court to determine. You don't get more categorical. Nothing, yes, it's not as if she put the asylum decision in some balancing exercise and then said, and that therefore outweighs X and Y and Z. Well, she clearly does say before that there is little purpose served by it limping on. Um, little purpose is served by allowing to limp on without further purpose. <laughs> the reality is. She decided, and I'm not saying she was right or wrong, the reason why she saw no purpose in going further was that the remedy could not be enforced. It was the absence of enforceability of the remedy that, in her view, meant that there was no purpose in dealing with things like Article 13b or the objections of the child or anything else. They couldn't look at the uh, validity of the grant of the uh, refugee status, and she thought because nothing else could be enforced, therefore... There was no purpose in dealing with Article 13b or any of the other articles. Well, I'm, I'm with my lord up to close to the, the yeah. end of that passage. So I'm with my lord in respect of little purpose. Yeah. I think I think it's unfair on on the lord judge, notwithstanding that next sentence, to suggest that she saw no purpose in the litigation because clearly there was a purpose that was urged, urged upon her, which is the purpose that's urged upon this court, and that is to precipitate the disclosure of the material with a view to seeking to challenge the Secretary of State um, with that material. Well, we're in that's danger of sentence. But look at the last sentence. I've considered separately whether there is any purpose in prolonging the life of the proceedings and reach the conclusion that there is not. I mean, it's all words, but the bottom line is this child 
cannot be returned in accordance with the court order to the Ukraine whilst there is the grant of refugee status in place. Yeah. Therefore, there's no point in us looking at anything under the Hague Convention. So the ultimate aim of the Hague Convention is to return children to where they were habitually resident and this child can't go back. I, I would suggest that she saw that as uh, a factor that towered over all the other factors. Yeah. And I say she's entitled to do that um, because she was entitled to have regard to um, the different uh, tests that apply in the different uh, processes that she would not be being required to look at matters directly relevant to asylum necessarily. She would be looking at Article 13b uh, and then the objections of the child. I found it difficult to see how a factor that wasn't re relevant to an asylum claim that was relevant to asylum claim could not be relevant to Article 13b. But when is the child making the application? I just how? Intolerability? Grave risk of harm? I mean, you, you, may, you, you may be able to postulate an example of when uh, a fact um, which would establish uh, a real risk of persecution would not uh, amount to a possible um, ground within Article 13b, but I, I find that difficult. Intolerability is a very broad word, and it's attached to grave risk of. So it's got to be reach a, a sufficient level of intolerability. Well, what I'd say is I, I, I think there's a danger potentially in seeking to equate. The David, you were saying the facts, the, that uh, a fact advanced in support of an asylum claim would not be relevant to an Article 13b defence? Well, it may or may not. I don't know. And I don't know in this case, and I don't know theoretically. In convention cases, you're talking about a well-founded fear of persecution yeah. on a convention reason, which the state will not protect you against. So there's got to be a well-founded fear of persecution. Persecution is quite a strong word. And then the other factors. So grave risk to the child and persecution, they're both looking at something that might harm someone. So the facts are going to be overlapping. It may be they're at, they're at a generic level, somebody comes from a particular ethnic grouping within the state and there's a coup and everybody at that stage is at risk. Or it may be more specific. But they are overlapping, aren't they? I'm, sure they're, I'm sure they're overlapping. No, like whether, whether or not the... Um, whether or not that means then that in a given case where asylum has been granted there will necessarily be the establishing of a 30, an Article 13b defence. Um, no, Steve, we were talking about the, ev the facts, the yes. evidence. And and because, because they're, as we discussed, different exercises, different people involved, different process, uh, perfectly possible that um, addressing even the same issue, two different tribunals might come to a different conclusion, but they're not addressing the same issue. But of course it might not be the case that the, the issue can be addressed by, for instance, the father. It may be that the persecution, the risk of persecution comes from a third source. Well, it may do it. It may be said to be the Ukrainian state aren't very friendly to Russian but, speakers. We don't know. But that is the, that's that would be explored if there was disclosure during the course of the rehearing. I, I think reducing it to its sort of core element, that the father's case is there has not been a fair determination of my Hague application because it was dismissed summarily. So what, what we're considering is what is required for there to be a fair determination of the Hague application in the light of the grant of asylum. And you're accepting that the judge had a discretion to determine or decide that there should be yes. a rehearing. And what I think your submissions were focused to is what were her reasons for deciding that in the circumstances of this case, a rehearing was not required 
for there to be a proper, fair determination of the asylum application. And that's what took us to 76. Yes. And that seems <coughs> to be pretty much it. Is that right? Well, I'm not sure that's fair. If one looks at um, paragraph 73, The other, the other aspect that the mayor judge considered that Roman numeral one is whether, in fact, the application amounts to an inquiry into the prospects of a collateral challenge to the Secretary of State's decision. So she had that in mind because she considered it did. She considered at an early stage that, in her judgment, that what the father was seeking to do was to launch fishing expedition, uh, that he therefore could not know what lay behind the, the veil, as it were, of the asylum decision, and was hoping that by this route, he would not get an order out of the Hague court that he hadn't already got. He would get a reiteration of his current order. But the purpose of it, therefore, was to uncover the information that lay behind the asylum decision, and therefore the ultimate purpose was to challenge the asylum well, decision. Th and that's one characterization of it. The purpose was to seek to procure the return of the child to Ukraine. In order to achieve that, two things would have to be accomplished. One, a, re a further return order, and second, a reconsideration and revocation of the asylum grant of asylum. Yes, but the father's objective is to seek to procure the return of the child. And what's wrong with that? Well, it's the he's got he's got his return order. He can't enforce it. So what is wrong with that is using the same process uh, to seek to bring it about by undermining another decision which is properly delegated to the Secretary of State. Would he be not... able to use the information if he got the asylum fine? If it was disclosed in the Hague Convention proceedings? I don't know about what the rules are. Would he be able to use that information in a claim for judicial review in the administrative court, or is there a limit on the use of the information? I'm not sure of the answer to that. I, I suspect the the uh, disclosure in the first instance would be disclosure in the Hague Convention. Within the Hague for the purposes process. of, yes. and I think you would need the permission of the yes. court to use it for any other purpose. Yes, you would then need to make that happen. So how would it then be for that collateral purpose? Well, you that, can't use it for that collateral purpose. That is, that, that's clearly what is envisaged in this case. That that is um, what, what in fact the judge says at um, 58, sorry, 73.1, insofar as the current application amounts to an inquiry into the prospects of a collateral challenge to the Secretary of State's decision in the asylum process, which I consider to be its principal focus. That's a determination she was entitled to reach not challenged, the application should be refused. So she came to a view as to the purpose of the application. The true purpose of the application was not to seek a return order, was not to seek a reiteration of a return order. The true purpose of the application <coughs> was to seek disclosure on the basis of that disclosure to challenge the Secretary of State's decision. And that the judge was entitled take into account in determining, to go back uh, to uh, my opening uh, point as to whether this was um, a proper use of the Hague process. It certainly wasn't an ordinary use, and was it a proper use? And she was entitled, I su suggest, when she's been asked to set aside four days of time to delay proceedings to um, deem an application made by the mother of the child prolong the litigation when the order that was sought was already in place but couldn't be enforced. She was absolutely entitled to look at the true purpose. And in my submission, this court cannot nor should not go behind her determination that this was the principal focus. She had the advantage of hearing the submission. And that was her view, and it's not challenged, that that was the principal focus of her. That's the same submissions that we're hearing today. Yes. Um, it's a slightly odd submission, it's not a finding of fact. 
I mean, that was obviously her views to the principal focus. That's not binding on us. <coughs> I mean, he can't be correct well, because that might be what he'd like to do, but he can't get the documents right. for that purpose unless he gets the court to agree. It's not binding on the court, but it is for this court to take account of how the judge was invited to deal with the application. And this judge was invited to... <laughs> this is her first point uh, at paragraph 73. The judge was entitled to come to the view that she did, having heard the submission she did. And what's the answer to my Lord's point? But he couldn't do that as a matter of law because the documents would only be disclosable in the Hague Convention proceedings. In the first instance, and then, and then uh, there would have to be an application to the uh, judge here in the Hague application. So he could, he could launch a collateral attack if he was given that permission. And what's well, that, that, that's further stages down the line. Yes. Um, at the moment... Uh, well, isn't that a... It, uh, the first, the, the, the purpose of the Hague Convention must be to, to get an order for the return of the child. That must be the purpose. Well, he had that. He, he did. But he got non compliance. Yes. And as things currently stand, it, it, it's not being enforced. And it could for reasons he doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. And you all want to say that that's justice. We might take a different view. And so we then need to look at the various steps. Uh, and what the, the first step is, should, the, should it be set aside? And then we're looking at the question of what a rehearing would involve. Now, the judge says, well, it, it's all immaterial because it's just a collateral challenge to the asylum decision. We're not bound by that. If we took the view, looked at in the round, that that wasn't the print, as she calls it, the principal focus. Well, if, if then, in that case, rhetorically, what is the principal focus? And is it, then, simply for the father to know? Because if it is simply for the father to know, and no more than that, then he can derive that information by an application under the Children Act based on the child's habitual residence and derive that information by an application of disclosure in those proceedings. It's not, a, it's not a proper, it's less of a proper, it's even less of a proper use of the Hague process to seek disclosure if you're not going to, with that disclosure, go beyond the Hague court. But the problem is, the information is different. He should have had a fair hearing about the allegations when he first came to court as to whether or not the child objected to going back and was of an age to say so, and whether there's a grave risk to the child if it went back. Now, he's never had that, and the Secretary of State hasn't reached a decision on the basis of a court's assessment of the evidence of risk to the child. And what he wants to do is do that. He'd have done it before normally, if there'd been proper disclosure beforehand of the allegations, and he wants to do it now. His scope for manure is limited. The Secretary of State may not revoke, he may not get permission to um, you know, seek uh, to use the documents for judicial review. He may have whole sets of circumstances. But uh, as my lord said, isn't he entitled at least to a fair hearing of whether those allegations would stop him getting the order? And if the court says, I'm sorry, but there is a grave risk, get on with it, live with the situation, find another way of dealing with the child. But if the situation is where there isn't a grave risk and the child doesn't really object in a true sense because he's been prompted to object, then he's got to decide what to do next. But he, he has that entitlement, as it were. We call it an entitlement. He, he's, he's open to um, that entitlement within uh, Children Act proceedings based on the child's habitual residence. Yeah, but, but what, he won't allow him to take the child back to the Ukraine, well, he can ask where the, the court. child lived until the child was taken away. But he can ask the court in this country to authorise that. Yes, as he can through the Hague. I mean, that, that, that is a... The trouble with that is you're suggesting, well, these proceedings should come to him, but he could have other proceedings. Well, the, the, which is I not cost-effective or in accordance with the overriding objective. Well, there were, Even in the family overriding. Very similar. Yes, they are. <laughs> they are the same. I noticed that one point this morning, I think in Mr. Harrison's oral submissions, he called it the overriding objection. Yes. Um, <laughs> which... 
perhaps is a fairer description of it. But he couldn't get a, an order in, the fam in any other family proceedings which allowed him to take the child to the Ukraine because that would breach the directive and so on. There is no order in any court in England that he can get at the moment which would allow him to take the child back to where the child was born and lived. No, what, I'm, what I say is that if, if he has an entitlement to this information, then the proper remedy for him is by way of an exercise of his parental responsibility, which is a matter determined by a court of welfare. And the child is officially resident now. And this court, the court of, of this jurisdiction, could make orders relating to the operation of parental responsibility and the whole, potentially the whole asylum process. And it could certainly, we, we can see, could certainly can order disclosure. So the entitlement to disclosure, if he has an entitlement, doesn't depend upon the Hague Court. And the reason why the judge was entitled to take the decision she did is that the Hague Court is all about a summary return. Was she not entitled to take account of the alternative remedy which ensured his Article 6, Article 8 rights available to him, where there would be a full welfare inquiry, or potentially a full welfare inquiry, rather <coughs> than a summary Hague inquiry. And so uh, 20 months now, or then, I should say, uh, after the application was made. Now, I appreciate that um, the first respondent uh, is responsible for much of that delay. Well, all but of it, isn't it? For all of it. Yeah. But um, sorry, this is a, this is. I'm not sure I'm fully understanding the submission. You're saying if he has an entitlement. So you're you're saying that this is addressing the point that he's using the Hague process to obtain the information. Yes. Because the suggestion. It right. seems to be that he should be entitled to see this yes. okay. and that the judge was entitled, should have allowed him a rehearing to enable him to see this and ha invite a court. And you're saying if that's the purpose, that's then not a proper use of the, the Hague process. Exactly. And the proper use is the um, welfare jurisdiction. The problem is he doesn't actually have the entitlement in the abstract to see the information at all, full stop. He's not given any rights no. in the context of the asylum thing. No. Disclosure arises as an adjunct to another right that he's got, the right to get the child taken back to the Ukraine because it was unlawfully taken away from the Ukraine, or the right to go and get whatever arrangements he can get for child-sharing orders and so on. There's no freestanding right to disclosure. It's an adjunct to another right. Yes. So if he's got a right to a fair hearing of his Hague Convention application, I don't see why that's any different at the moment to any right to any other charge sharing arrangement order he might make. He makes the application, well, and if he's entitled to the information to enable that application to be dealt with fairly and justly, he'd get it. And if he's not, he won't get it. Well, I think it comes, it comes back to the, the point about this Hague process being a summary process the judge being entitled to take account of that and the further delay that would be envisaged in the application that the uh, father sought to make uh, and the ultimate decision that a Hague court would have to make on a fully contested uh, application to set aside being probably three years, two and a half, three years after the application uh, was initially made for summary return. So in our submission, the, um, the court was entitled to say this was not the right thing even if there is uh, a gross unfairness to this father, there is a, a vehicle available to him, and that is the substantive welfare jurisdiction in this country under which he can obtain his disclosure. Does what the does the court do with parents who don't cooperate with the process then? We simply say we don't accept the judgment of the court as to what's in the best interest of the child and just don't comply, don't give the information bring applications at a later stage, we just say, well, they win. Well, the, Never mind each, how harmful each, that is to the child's interest. Yeah, well, I mean, each court, each case has to be determined on its merits in, in the circumstances of a particular case. And what we do know, that this is not a case where the court is looking at a set-aside um, 
against the delay caused by an unmeritorious asylum claim. Pursued for one appeal and then another, and everything on hold, pursuant to G&G &G until those remedies are exhausted. What this court knows is that the Secretary of State has found that this child is a refugee, is entitled to protection, uh, flowing from the status of asylum or the status of refugee. And so it will depend on the circumstances of the case. And in our submission, the court was perfectly entitled. See, what's unusual about this case, both courts or both processes had <coughs> completed. So the, there had been a full abduction inquiry, mm. albeit potentially without some information. And there'd been a full asylum determination. G and G, in, in my submission, is primarily directed to a process, a situation where one uh, may have concluded before the other. And what happened here is that the abduction case concluded and that information in its entirety was transferred over to the Secretary and of State. And more consider. information apparently added that the court hadn't seen. That's the problem. Without any explanation as to why yes. the parents didn't provide it to the court. That's the troubling thing. In my, in and then you think, well, if the parent did that, maybe you've got to go back to square one and say, right, do it properly this time. Tell the court everything. That's the way it works. And the court will take its decision on Article 13. Well, as I say, she, she might have done that. Well, she should have done it, shouldn't she? Are you hey, entitled under the Hague Convention to hold stuff back from the court? She was entitled, in my, in my submission, to conclude that, in fact, this was not about that process. This was about a process uh, which was centred upon a challenge to the Secretary of State's decision. Mm -hmm. Mr. Toomey, I understand what you say about each case on, on its own facts, and of course that's right. But you will understand from my Lord's questions that the concern here is the message that it sends. The message that this case, on these facts, which are, as a blanket, unmeritorious, the message that that sends, that's the difficulty. So yes. whilst you're, of course you're right, that you have to look at each case on its own facts, we have to be very careful. I suppose the, the other matter that must have weighed heavily on the judge in, in her determination was the, the position of the child mm. and the, the clarity of his position as portrayed to the court by his guardian. Well, we looked at that with Mr. Haynes and on, on the basis that this is all an automatic, um, effectively cut off, it, it's arguable how much that is actually. Well, in doing, in doing justice to the case and, and the application of the Oakwright objective, it, it, she was entitled uh, to take account of that position because to do justice in a case involving children is routinely to do the best for that child. Of course. You'll have to remind me of the dates, but certainly of the three Kafka's reports that we've seen, at least two, I can't remember the date of the third one, at least two raising the problems uh, that the child was having were before the courts that took the decision. Uh, and indeed, I forget if Mr. Peel or Mrs. Justice Sace, who actually dealt with the extent to which the child was able at that stage, I know it's two years on now, to articulate fully, properly concerned objections to whether or not he wanted to go back or stay in the Ukraine, the extent to which that was the result of influence by others. Yes. Well, I mean, I, it's not right to say that was never looked at, but you'll tell me about the third Kafka's report, whether that was or wasn't before, Mr. Justice Peel. I just haven't looked at the dates. Uh, may I check? Yeah. That was the decision, uh, sorry, that was a report of the 9th of March. 21. Which year? 2021. So that came after all the two the two court hearings then, yeah. And the first two were before at least one of the other judges. Yeah. So the judge could look at the latest report if there's a Hague reconsideration. And it may be the father will learn that the child's objections have changed and hardened and become more mature with time. And the father may have to live with that. We don't know. Well, I think that, that position... The judge was certainly keen to, if I understand it, it wasn't there, was to urge upon the father consideration of a substantive welfare application within the jurisdiction. 
So to come back to Lord, Lord Justice Wilson's inquiry with me in, in relation to um, the message, I think I think the the difficulty with um, an act of abduction is that it is a, an improper, it's a misuse of parental responsibility. Um, it's a wrongful act. And the asylum process, where there is no entitlement to asylum, is and can routinely be used as a tactic in cases. Uh, and that can, and that on the operation of G&G &G will lead to delay. And sometimes that delay can be decisive if the court is dealing with a child of a certain age and issues of intolerability or uh, objection. So, in one respect, as soon as the shutter comes down upon the application for the meritorious or unmeritorious, we don't know till it's dissolved, application for asylum, as soon as the shutter drops and the Hague is put on ice, the difficulty sets in and one don't, then is shut out from knowing. Uh, and one can obtain disclosure. Maybe one can obtain disclosure before the first appeal or before the second appeal. Maybe one can weigh that in the balance, but until uh, until there is that first or second or ultimate final appeal, and the decision is made that asylum is um, not to be granted, then then it's had its effect. So but that is not this case. That's that, the trouble. No, because the, this case, the delay has, uh, as you very fairly accept, are all on the mother's part. So that would be part of the message. It's all right routinely to breach court orders, it's all right to get to the end of the line on the Hague Convention claim and then make an asylum claim. And don't tell the court everything early on in case the court expresses a view that the Secretary of State accepts. Hide everything. Wait, wait, wait. Well, these, these decisions, these difficult issues, are not, are not new to family courts where, for example, a child might be alienated by one parent against another, mm. but nonetheless, um, the child's guardian, as often the child is represented in such a case, will say, notwithstanding the damage that's been perpetrated by one parent, we can't do anything about it. Mm. Yes. So I, you know, I, this is, as it were, meat and drink to the family courts. Mm. Yes. Um, but this is the abuse of the process, or potentially the abuse of the process. It's, it's over. Because, and, because and, of the, the repeated breaches of court orders. And so for a, a, a position, in, for a, a parent in a position, a left behind parent in a difficult position, mm. which this court might consider um, applies to the father, that um, there is, it's important to remember that there is open to him a jurisdiction. He's not shut out. And it's a full welfare jurisdiction. And so we would suggest that it's not, therefore, right to cast the position of the father as one whose Article 6 and Article 8 rights are uh, over, overrun, because, how, how, or indeed the child, because how could that be the case where there is open to the court of, or open to him a full welfare rather than a summary of the process? Well, the problem with the child is already lost out. The child grew up in one country and should have been uh, living there and had its rights decided by the court there. One parent broke the law and took the child away. That parent wouldn't even cooperate with the court in the country where the parent went to. And years later, the child is then in a situation where it's been taken from its homeland, uh, it's been alienated from its father on one analysis, uh, and had an environment of worry with the constant court proceedings hanging over him and his family. It's no wonder he would suffer. Well, my lord, those are precisely the sorts of welfare issues that are best looked at on a full welfare. Or by complying with the court order early on, but not by well, no, we don't know that. Always to this that, ship, that ship has sailed. Yeah, and there we are. We're back to where we were this morning. Mm. You're stuck with it. Yeah. The parent can well, just ultimately, the that's the submission. You, that ship has sailed. Well, my lord, that that I'm afraid the court has to. For as long you say the court has to accept that, and um, um, the fact that there's been constant abuse of the process doesn't matter. Well, my lord, it does matter. Well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter in the result. In the result in the Hague process. Well, that's the one we're, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we're here to but it doesn't address. Yes, but it doesn't shut the, the father. No, that's, but that's different remedies. And, and 
an entirely different um, um, set of uh, objectives and doesn't uh, 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 give rise to the, the, the Hague Convention summary remedy. I don't know whether that's right, but, but, um, but it's far, a case that has reached the case <coughs> stage of this case is far better in our submission and that no judgment is likely to consider far better job within the full welfare jurisdiction. Because it's got to a we've got to a stage now where this is not about assembly of the judge. And if it is about the father understanding the asylum decision, uh, it's not going to lead him to enforcing the return order based on the summary return process. It should return the child. If the child is to be returned or any orders to be made in respect of the child, they're made on a full welfare evaluation at this distance in time from the original removal to the jurisdiction. I think and, from your... Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, and is this right? Until those proceedings are started, and until, what, there's an application for the asylum documents in that, that uh, under that legislation and, and that application, uh, the asylum documents won't be provided. Well, that's right. I think that's right. right. But the um, whether whether the court could have deemed him to have made an application under the Children Act or required well, the problem him to with that is that, that he may then be we may be then deeming him to have given up other rights. So that may be more difficult. But well, um, at all events, he'd have to go through all of those hoops mm -hmm. even to make an application to see the reasons why he's in the position he's in. Well, my lord, the, the application is easily and swiftly made, and the uh, disclosure application could have been listed before the same judge who had been asked to refer back to herself. Particularly as she had access to all that information and considered it, so he could have, he could have been asked he could have asked to issue the I'm not saying he wanted to do this, but had he asked, he could have issued the application the following day and got an early listing before the same judge to determine it under the um, jurisdiction that primary jurisdiction of the courts of England and Wales. I think one submission you've said that it, um, the court's decision as to the form of the rehearing depends on all the circumstances of the case. And, and so you would accept from that that the circumstances include the history of the proceedings yeah. and the history of the asylum application and what Mrs. Justice Roberts says about the differences. Yes. That is, that's part of the relevant material that the court should consider when deciding what form a rehearing should take. Yes, indeed. I mean, I wouldn't what, necessarily... Where do you say it sits in the balance? Well, first of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, want, it to, uh, I wouldn't want to be understood as saying that the judge in this situation would necessarily have the asylum material. No, 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 I wasn't saying that. I was this judge. What I was saying, <laughs> what, what I was asking uh, you to make a submission or a comment on, that two, two Hague applications, both return orders, all the history that we've discussed, the fact that then after that, several months later, uh, an asylum claim is made by the child, different material, where does that sit in the balance of determining the form of the rehearing, or whether there should be an effective rehearing. I, I think that uh, my submission is that the judge was entitled to regard those factors as having little weight in the balance, and that the overriding, that the, the factor which had the greatest weight was the fact of the grant of asylum. And where does the judge ref weigh those factors in the balance in her judgment? I think. Paragraph 76, where she apply, refers to the little purpose. Clearly, she had a purpose in mind. No, no, I'm talking about taking into account two successful Hague applications, return orders, uh, committal application, uh, repeated applications for stay, followed by, where does the judge take into account that history and the different information when weighing up what form the rehearing should take? Well, all I can say is that she certainly is alive to the history. Right. She sets it out, and there isn't a there isn't an adverse comment about a prior adverse comment about the mother that isn't 
highlighted in her judgment. So she doesn't shy away from all the adverse matters relating to the um, first respondent mother. Um, uh, whether uh, she expressly brings all of those factors together, I don't think she does. Well, that's right. It just yeah. But I mean, because you, you were saying you you're accepting they were relevant. Yes. And what what I was just asking for is where do we see the judge taking those rel that relevant material into account? And you you're saying because it's in the background, so she can well, be well, assumed say, to have taken it into yeah. account. It's more it, it's it's set out in, in some detail when she sets out the background history of the case. And as I say, she doesn't shy away from, and he highlights some of the adverse references in previous judgments to, to the mother. But she clearly had those matters in mind. Um, Thank you. Is that? I think it might. I just, yes. Thank you, Mr. Any questions? talking across purposes earlier on. Um, as my Lord has just pointed out, the, uh, the mother did make a statement on the 12th of May. In these proceedings? Um, it looks like in response to the committal application, because it says I'm a litigant person um, represented by solicitors only in the committal proceedings, or was it in support of a stay? Don't, don't. The committal. It was in respect of the committal. I'm instructed to say, yes. Yeah. Hang on, is that correct? It's made in person, and uh, the mother says that she's represented by lawyers in committal proceedings, and this appears to be um, paragraph one I make this statement as a litigant in person in the main Hague Convention proceedings. So although you say uh, that it's in the committee proceedings, it looks as if that's not accurate from the opening words that the mother has used. And it says the statement is made to update the court on the recent developments. And paragraph three says, you've got to stay at Misha's, at the boys applied for asylum. It doesn't give us anything more than that. So I don't think it is, as you now say, in support of the resistance to the committee. May I just check what the position is? B1, supplementary one. Yeah. I mean, is that in paragraph 3 of us? No. Or is it a new event or what? I'm sure we should. Hmm? Well, thank you. I'm, I'm instructed that the funding, public funding, uh, was granted to the mother only in respect of the committal application yeah. because of the nature of it. And therefore she was, as it were, representing herself mm -hmm. on the main application at that point, but had the benefit of solicitors on the committal application. Yeah, but this application is made in the main application. So this committal. statement is support of her application for a stay, or what? I'm just trying to look at the dates. It's the tw this is the 12th of May. And, um, just to update. Yeah, just... Can I just, perhaps it would assist if um, I can check in due course the direction that gave rise. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and paragraph three simply records that an asylum claim has been made on behalf of the child. Well, that's right. And the um, and nothing about no what gave to rise to it or led to it or anything else. No, and her, her public funding on the uh, main application came to her a couple of days before the hearing. I think it was because when, I can't remember, I think it was when you were making submissions, I think we were, we were this, 
we were asking questions, you were making submissions on the basis the mother hadn't provided any evidence at all following the determination by Mr. Peel of the return application. And that's why there was no explanation, there was nothing about how the asylum claim would be made, whether there had been a new event or anything. And I, and I think uh, we're drawing your attention to this because there was evidence, but there is no mention in it as to what led to the asylum claim being made. Thank you, my Lord. That, that, and I'm grateful. And it, it seems to be simply a, um, the fact of it. Yes. I'm, t I'm told, and we'll check this, but I'm told that it was um, simply uh, filed by the mother voluntarily without a prior direction. Okay, okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 Mr. Harrison helpfully says that uh, it's regarded as a position statement. As a what? As effectively as a position statement. Right, okay, okay. Thank you. In other words, I think my, my, my only. Oh, sorry, yes. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm uh, simply asking the court to accept that the land judge was correct uh, when she came to the conclusion that she did a paragraph 76, particularly in that third um, sentence, was entitled to come to that conclusion. That was the right conclusion on the facts. So it, alternatively, it was not a conclusion that this court should appeal it. I imagine that there isn't anything, but if there is anything, I can assist with further. I don't think so. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Payne, how long do you think your submissions uh, will take? Well, my lord, uh, um, today that is. Sorry, the, uh, and I'm so, not going to start making. No, I was interrupting you already because I was just saying we've asked a lot of questions, so I was giving you a foretaste of no, no, what I was, might happen tomorrow. I, I was just saying, my lord, I, ha I had a foretaste of what, what I think I'm going to be asked, and it's a, it's a sad moment for me because I always act on behalf of the government, and everyone's always criticising the government for being too harsh on asylum seekers, whereas here. I'm now going to be criticised, or not criticised, the government is going to be criticised for the approach um, to refugee claims in, in the sense that it stifles the... I don't think... No, no, right? no, no, not at all. Well, there is... I mean, there's been a... a, a Common uh, ground on that. Not at all. Well, there is... A, there, there, I mean, to, to be frank, I mean, um, having heard the question, well, I, I'll, I'll keep my submissions for tomorrow on those, but I, I think I'll probably be about an hour and a half, or at least... Can I say I, absolutely not? There's no criticism at all. Uh, an asylum application was claim was made. It had to be determined, and it was determined relatively quickly. No, uh, ab ab so uh, no, absolutely. No, I'm, I wasn't saying in, in so far as the secretary has acted in this particular case, but in terms of the asylum process, the focus seems to be very much at the moment on policy considerations that apply to the Hague Convention. Um, for example, my lord, you, you said um, the message. What message does it send out? Well, I mean, if one looks at it from the asylum perspective, one might ask, well, what message does it send out that when you've been granted asylum, yeah, you d there isn't a statutory appeal process to challenge that, but you can nevertheless have it ch challenged by way of alternative proceedings. No, it's not no, going it's to be challenged. Well, the one thing that everyone accepts is that this asylum decision can't be overturned or reviewed by the Hague Court. Oh. All the Hague Court can do is say, if only we'd been given, as we should have been given, the allegations at the start, We'd have made a decision, and the Secretary of State would have looked at that, as no doubt she looked at Mrs. Justice Seasons of Peel's judgment. It's not your problem that you had new information, it's other people's problems. Uh, uh, well, my lawyer, I mean, I, I'll make my submissions on, yeah. on that. And, and the, sorry, to, the other thing is that Lord Stevens expressly recognises mm. that there might be a reconsideration following a Hay Court's decision. That's all this is about. It's not a, a, a challenge to, an attack on the decision. It's two processes working uh, separately, but hopefully in some sort of harmony. Absolutely, my lord. So, um, can, I, um, can I just answer my lord's just question about the letter? Uh, oh, the, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so, it, it, it is a standard process to only effectively issue decisions with. Two, two lines, lines with, without qualify for asylum, and you have five years leave to remain. Uh, yeah. Two separate decisions. Two separate yes. One giving leave and one absolutely for refugee status. Absolutely. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So ten thirty tomorrow.